program because the organizers are very responsible people. I know them. They wouldn't just not turn up. So it's probably a misunderstanding. But um, perhaps we can have a general discussion about the topic. Um, I'm sure that within the, the collective of people here and people online, we can share some information about this. I can personally share information about one piece of it, which was the, 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 the norm, the global norm on the protection of the public core of the internet, Euro, which came out of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. I was a commissioner on that commission. It's not the same, I have to say. It was inspired by the Dutch uh, understanding of protecting the public core, which was first developed by an academic called Dennis Bruders. Um, so it's different from that, but it was inspired by that. So hopefully we can have uh, um, some, some more conversation about this. And what I suggest is that we actually, we do have somebody from the Dutch government, from the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs with us online, but maybe we should just start by asking questions and then we can see if we can answer one another's questions and, and take it from there. And I'm happy to sort of be an informal uh, chair of the discussion here. So I see there's a hand over there. I just wanted to check our online participants. Can you all hear us? Just type in the chat if you can hear us. Yes, you can hear us. Thanks, Jenna. Um, and and, and Famke from, from the ministry confirms that she didn't know about a cancellation either. Famke, if you can try and locate Mariolaine or, or Natalie, that would be wonderful. And if you are also able to speak, that would be even more wonderful. Okay, we have a question from, the, from, from someone in the room. Please just introduce yourself and go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, Alexander Savnin, uh, civil society from Russia still. Uh, is there any public document stating uh, official Dutch position on Internet Core? Because actually there was only a link to the government website. And it will be interesting to read if uh, exists something to ask more, well, professional questions. Thanks. Can anyone answer uh, Alexander's question? I don't know if Famke can answer it. I, I can't answer it. I do know that if you go online, and if you do a search for the work of Dennis Brutus, you'll find something. Oh, we have one of our colleagues from Japan. He has an answer. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, Koichiro from JP Third, Japan Computer Emergency Response Team. And uh, with Andrietti, I was also part of the, uh, uh, part of the uh, commission uh, on uh, global cyber stability. And, uh, to answer the question uh, from, from you, uh, the, the concept of public core of the internet was first introduced by a uh, Dutch scholar called Dennis Broders, and he wrote a book uh, on, well, so, so that, that it's, was It's the called The Public Core of the Internet, an International Agenda for Internet Governance. And it is a printed book, however, uh, the PDF version is also uh, available for free. And um, simply put, uh, what, he pro uh, what, he, what, what he proposed with his book is, you know, we should, we should understand military or government sometimes undermine the, uh, some function of the internet. However, in those cases, the insurers argue that we should prevent as attacking the very core of the internet includes, for example, DNS system, uh, uh, submarine cables, data center, uh, time protocol servers, and many others. So that's what he initially proposed. Thank you. He's not from the government, but the, gov the Dutch government has taken this proposal very seriously. And they can share themselves what their official position is, but I know that they have, they have really, I think, um, practiced, or, you know, their belief in it as a valuable uh, uh, principle in many in many respects. What we then did, the, the the two of us were involved in this commission. We were tasked with developing some norms 
that could promote stability and security in cyberspace. This work started in 2017 at the Global Commission, and it was really because there was this break at the group of governmental experts. I don't know how many of you followed the discussion that the, the group of governmental experts um, at the UN First Committee that talked about international cybersecurity agreed on some norms in 2011, but then they had another round of meetings. They couldn't really agree on a report, and we then wanted to build on that work, but we also felt that there was a need for norms, not just for states, to ensure responsible state behavior in cyberspace, but also norms that are multi-stakeholder, that need to be respected by all state stakeholders, not non-state actors included. And that is when we came up with this norm on the protection of the public core of the internet. Uh, working very much with the Dennis Bruder uh, um, um, definition, and the norm is called the non-interference with the public core, I'll just read it, without prejudice to their rights and obligations, state and non-state actors should not conduct or knowingly allow activity that intentionally and substantially damages the general availability or integrity of the public core of the internet and therefore the stability of cyberspace. And we do define the public core to include packet routing and forwarding, naming and numbering systems, cryptographic mechanisms of security and identity, and physical transmission media, such as you said, the, the undersea cables. And I mean, there was a debate about how much wider you know, we would go, but that's really um, what we came up with. And we had some success with this norm in the sense that it was reflected in the Paris call, which is a, another set of, of, of principles that, that, that have been um, called people, governments and other stakeholders have been asked to respond to it. And within the European Union as well, some of the statements and declarations on internet stability have also um, taken on that, that norm. Maybe not in precisely the same words, but more or less. By the way, someone online, thanks, um, Vyacheslav uh, um, Erokin has posted the link online in the Zoom um, to the book, to Dennis Bruder's book. Anyone online have any comments or questions or contributions to this discussion? Just put up your hand. Marek, Marek, please go ahead, introduce yourself, and let's hear from you. Yeah, hi, uh, can you hear me? Very clearly. Yeah, this is Marek, I'm with the, the UK government, um, and yeah, coming to this session more from the perspective of learning about this kind of concept uh, of the public core, um, and I guess in that kind of spirit, I think that this kind of general idea of sort of protecting the public internet is is a very kind of appealing one, recognizing that it is kind of something that we all share in common. I guess with this kind of specific work, um, both uh, from kind of the, the, coming from the kind of Dutch um, kind of work that's mentioned as well as the, uh, the Global Commission. Um, so this norm is kind of about non-interference. Um, so is that kind of covering sort of individual actions, um, is that right? And I guess in that context, kind of how does that fit with sort of global or sort of multi-stakeholder governance, um, or is it really just more about kind of individual actions? Um, and then also kind of related to that, is there an element also in thinking about the interaction between sort of companies um, being kind of the ones maintaining some of this uh, sort of infrastructure um, cables were mentioned, and is there kind of an interaction between sort of the private sector as well and, and the role um, with the kind of public core? Uh, I, sorry, I recognize this, these are sort of more questions or, or areas to flesh out understanding for, for myself um, that I probably should read about, but I'd be interested in thoughts from um, yourself, Henriette, or others in the room, kind of on these aspects and how they interplay with this kind of concept of the public core. 
Um, thanks, Thank you. thanks, Marek. Well, I can respond, and I think maybe the two of us can respond from the Global Commission perspective, which is not the same as the Dutch uh, government's perspective, although we did collaborate very closely with colleagues from the Netherlands in that. The idea actually was precisely that this norm would compel state actors and non-state actors, but also state actors in their relationship to non-state actors. And it, it really came from both the, the, the concern about uh, um, damage or, or threats against the public core that came from state act actors and their, and, and their proxies, proxies, but also from certain commercial practices um, that, that was coming from the corporate sector that we felt could also put the public uh, core at risk. So, Marek, I think the idea was, and I think this is maybe where if we step away from the Global Commission and maybe more into what I think the Dutch government is interested in as well, and which I personally am interested in, is can we use this idea of the Internet having a public core to actually become a principle that underpins how we do internet governance. So, but that is just, that's still just a conversation. I, we have a hand in the room from, um, from, from uh, Paul and Chris Burkridge and then yourself and then you. Thanks, Henriette. Um, Chris Burkridge here from RIPE NCC. Um, I, I, so I think what I wanted to do was maybe just draw some parallels to some of the more specific conversations going on this week about um, fragmentation and particularly about sanctions and there was one this morning and we did um, one on, on Wednesday afternoon um, about sanctions as they're applied to um, uh, core internet functions let's call them. I'm, I'm, I tend to try and steer away from that public core terminology just because it is useful but also brings with it some baggage because of the, the UN discussions. Um, but I mean I think the one thing that sort of becomes clear is that the norm is very useful. Part of what having a norm there helps to engender, hopefully, is trust that that norm will be followed. That, that's kind of what there needs to be for a multi-stakeholder um, governance model. So you, using institutions like the RIRs or ICANN or other sort of non-state governance institutions, there needs to be trust that they will be able to operate separate and above political concerns, that even though they will be essentially in the private sector and under the jurisdiction of wherever they are, that that won't prevent them from carrying out that core function of the internet. Um, and I think that's where that's where sanctions undermine that. That's That's been very much the sort of RIPE NCC's argument and discussion for the last several months. Um, but perhaps you know, using that, that idea of uh, the norm and using now the OEWG is talking about um, confidence building measures, maybe that, that's sort of, I don't have a solution or a, a specific mechanism, but at least an, a goal to aim towards is how, what could we do to engender that trust that the norm will be followed, that the norm will apl apply to um, all of the entities involved in these core governance functions. Uh, hi, uh, I'm going to introduce yourself. Hi, Paul. Uh, Paul, um, I'm going to avoid going into the um, minefield that is the problems at Afrinec and the monumental stupidity of the NRO letter to the Mauritian government. For present purposes, we can have that conversation later. Um, but I, I, I'm just wanting to, to touch into two issues that that I think do do come up. Um, when we talk about the core, and, and you specifically mentioned, you know, you want to avoid the use of the term public, uh, and that is that, um, you know, uh, the core of a network you can generally identify based on what infrastructure it is and so on and so forth. I think public is the interesting thing. Um, and I think if we get into a situation where it's understood that certain core infrastructure that is maybe privately owned, <laughs> but there is a public interest in it, um, invites... Um, additional protections or invites this sort of additional um, interest in there being a public good coming from it. I think then we're getting into the sort of space in which we can be asking questions about what mechanisms and what 
circumstances give rise to giving mechanisms of protection to ensure that the public core isn't interfered with. And uh, you know, so I can, can note something, irony is not quite the right word, but I, I think it's, it's, it's notable that amongst governments, the Dutch government has been ahead of the game in, in, in this discussion, both because there's a Dutch academic who was involved, but also if you consider how much private internet infrastructure is part of the Dutch economy by virtue of the Amsterdam Internet Exchange, by virtue of the you know, location of right within um, Dutch jurisdiction and so on and so forth. So I'm inclined to the view that governments that are, you know, the government of a jurisdiction that has a, a large internet economy and that depend, you know, for various reasons on the idea of the public internet functioning are more likely to take a protective view of the public internet core, of the pub, uh, public core internet, whereas jurisdictions that see the internet as a threat to their, their state um, ability to repress their own people will take a very different view. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Koichiro, it's, it's your turn again. Yeah, uh, thank you. Again, Koichiro from uh, JP Cert, and I'm an engineer by train, but let me share with you, I, I think this, uh, uh, Paul might be very interested in, in this, but um, there's a very interesting development at the field of uh, international law. I think the public core of the internet norm prohibit the uh, attack to public core in, in, the, in the peace time. And if there's a war time, we have different, different rules, which is the, which right now the Geneva Protocol and Geneva Convention and uh, additional protocols and other IHOs. Now, we see Russia shoot a cruise missile to a data center in Ukraine. And that's one of many well, example of things, go, things going wrong. I mean, in a, in a wartime, maybe the, the server is in ripe, or uh, I don't know. I I can may not have critical information, but uh, the the telecoms uh, they do have a critical servers and computers and uh, network equipment. So those equipment might be the target of uh, kinetic operation. Now, uh, what is interesting uh, with, with this area is ICLC, International Committee on Red Cross. Uh, ICLC uh, started the discussion on what they call digital emblem. So in the kinetic war, uh, Geneva Convention, additional protocol prohibit anyone to attack or undermine the civilian object, includes the hospitals, libraries, museums, anything not directly related to military operation. If there's a bridge, very useful or very assist the military operation, that's, that's the uh, military object in, in this context. Now, uh, ICLC um, like to have a similar distinction on military object and uh, civilian object in the cyberspace. So uh, we were part of this discussion uh, since last year. I think the, the third computer emergency response teams servers, I really want, want, want them, you know, recognized as a civilian object because we are not part of the offensive cyber operation. And there's no doubt uh, the equipment owned by ISPs should be should be part of the uh, sh should be part of uh, civilian object and uh, pro protected by international law even in the in, in the wartime. But the discussion is right now is, is ongoing, and uh, you may like to follow that discussion. Thank you very much. Um, Kuchira, thanks for mentioning that. In fact, when we were in the Commission, I think one of our meetings, I think in Geneva, we, we actually had the ICRC contribute to our work. And they have since this year, they actually have now opened a division in Luxembourg for, for cyberspace. And what the ICRC has done, the International Committee on the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, is they've actually done research on, on what the humanitarian impacts 
are of cyber attacks um, during times of conflict. And, the, and, the, and we just spent a lot of time discussing this in the commission. It's very hard to say w this notion that, you, you, that certain infrastructure can be legitimately attacked during a kinetic war and others not. It's very hard to apply that in cyberspace because of the ripple effect and the unintended uh, consequences. We have Chris, we have Alexander and Alexander and then and then Chris and then um, Koichiro and then Paul. And I'm checking for online as well. And by the way, if you go online, if you do a a, a search for ICRC and cyber, you'll find lots of useful resources. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, well, for pointing out to Russia because uh, I was thinking how to interfere uh, with, with what I want to like uh, to say. Uh, actually, uh, what we are talking about public core of internet uh, is um, uh, it's on about that every government actually, we were talking about every stakeholder, different stakeholders should uh, consider uh, the same. Russian government thinks that there is Russian internet which must be sovereign uh, and which are actually owned by Ram, um, must be controlled by Russian government and actually they actively work uh, uh, exactly is, uh, in same modality that internet of each country is actually the governmental thing and again if you are talking about war uh, it's a legitimate target because uh, so uh, actually your, your point uh, nearly forces me to say that some countries does not well uh, share Dutch values on uh, what is public core of internet. Uh, and uh, replying to you actually, sorry, uh, you, you may blame me, uh, I never told it publicly before, uh, but actually you remember this uh, letter from Deputy Minister of Ukraine uh, asking, uh, just asking about well, revo revocation of domain and actually uh, I was scared li reading this letter much more not that Russian domain and Russian IP address was revoked, I trusted Dutch people. Uh, but uh, that could open for Russian government uh, ways to start cyber war. Actually the same deputy minister uh, given an interview like Ukraine have cyber army with attacking Russia and something like. So it instantly brought in infrastructure of communications, of civil communications in, into war. It, it, it's not like, well, I'm not so saying that Putin is doing well. But actually in the, I, I, exactly at uh, your point that you mentioned that Ukrainian government said, okay, we are also well uh, bringing this to war. So that that's will be re really difficult for uh, actually, <clears throat> Red Cross, yeah, to uh, apply these marks, uh, and they, as far as I remember from discussions of uh, Ukrainian activists, they were very skeptical on this way, also. And by the way, everyone, I've, ha I've heard from our Dutch colleagues, the session was actually cancelled. Um, <laughs> and that's why they are not here. They say they apologize and they say that they're very happy that we are continuing with an informal discussion. Um, Chris, it's your turn next. And there's a, there's a question from Jorge Cancio from Switzerland in the Zoom saying how the public core, he says the question is how the public core can be protected effectively vis-a-vis -vis hard law interventions and the example of sanctions. How do we respond? Going to leave that one till a bit later. <laughs> um, so, okay, where was I going? Well, first, a, a slight clarification. Uh, my, my issue is not with the public aspect of the public core. My issue is more with the full formulation of public core because of the, the baggage. And, and part of that baggage, I think, is that in the formulation that it, it, it is in the GCSC report. It, it's probably broader than I think is useful. I think it, it sort of pulls more into that idea of the public core than is easy to 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 protect, essentially. I think, and, and the discussion about wartime, and I think illustrates that, that there, if you, so the more you pull into that public core, the more questions you're going to create about, you know, how, how can it be protected? What level, to what ex degree should you go to protect it? Um, and perhaps I'm, speaking from a personal bias or, a, or institutional bias in saying that, you know, there are, there are some really fundamental things like the number registries, like the root zone file that I think are un inarguably that public core. But then I think you start to get fur uh, further away from that as, what as it goes. What about the cables? 
Tables is an interest. I, I mean, I think the, the I, I, I absolutely see the point. I don't want, and I, I when I say this, I don't I don't say it to sort of um, in any way undermine the importance of them. Or, but I, I think you're talking about publicly owned cables usually um, there, and that that starts to be a very difficult area. Whereas I think what I would say about the root zone file and the number registries is that they are not privately owned in any traditional sense. I, I, I believe, and I, there, there may be some discussion to have there, but um, I, I think that's, a, and yeah, so I, I think there's levels there which start to complicate the discussion, and, and there is a balance to be struck of um, do we want to make this easy, or do we want to make this cover everything we feel it should cover, and then just work as hard as we can to make that happen. And I'm, yeah, so maybe I'm coming down on a slightly more let's limit it and try and get it, get something done versus let's be broad and work hard and maybe not achieve. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left. Maybe we should, that's what we should be doing with the rest of our, f our 15 minutes. Like having, and having other people who haven't spoken yet as well say, what do they think about this? Do we need this, this norm to protect the public core? And taking the challenge Chris has just posed, which is how do we define it? Do we find it very narrowly as the protocols and the routing system? Or do we also look at the infrastructure, which is owned partially publicly or by governments, by, 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 by private sector? But that's the whole internet, isn't it? So because we've got 15 minutes left, and it would be interesting, I think, to leave the session with some ideas as well. So we have a, a hand here, Paul, we have Kochiro, and then please other, Kinori, so, and others as well, please, let's hear from you. Um, the, the thing I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your, what you've, you've taken into con conclusion, particularly things like the root file, which is not needing to be at a physical location, but the stuff that, that you're tra treating as core is actually the easiest stuff to, to protect. But I, I don't think that it's, it's necess necessary for us to go a, if we define, or sorry, if we accept that infrastructure that serves a public function or enables the public internet to exist should be protected, that that means it's an all of protection. You know, if you look at the cable example, if there are four undersea cables and one of them gets hit, the public internet doesn't go down. It, it, it causes routing one. problems. If there is only one, it's, it's a very different scenario. And, and especially if we, if we look at the fact that most of this discussion, I think, rightfully should concern peacetime then we, we should state that there is a norm and there should be a norm amongst governments that they take an interest in ensuring that public internet is protected. That I think is, we don't, we don't need to, to, to have a all of, of, of state protection, you know, or putting armed guards, um, you know, outside the, the, the cable station. That, that, that I think is, is going overkill. But as a peacetime measure, I think it is protection. Yes, uh, thank you. This is a very uh, interesting topic. And uh, I cannot predict the future, and I don't know how to protect the internet in the, in the, well, um, in the, in a, in a war time. Uh, what I can share with you is uh, there's a f fascinating book wrote by, I forgot the first name, someone, uh, some Hedrick, uh, on uh, telegraphy network. Uh, and his central argument was, you know, communication infrastructure has been and will be destroyed in the world time, regardless of what we prepared. History proved in, in the 19th century, when there's a war between Spain and the United States, the first thing they did, first thing the United States did is destroy the Spanish communication infrastructure. And the early, you know, 100 years ago, when Japan had a war against Russia, the next day we declared a war, we destroyed Russian submarine cable running through the East Japan Sea. So that's what hap w that is what happened 100 years ago. And I'm not necessarily saying you know, we will, we are going to repeat the same thing again and again, but there's a 
well, um, yeah, I, I like to prevent same thing happening again, but who knows? Thank you. Akinori, introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, Akinori Maimura from JPNIC, Japan Network Information Center. Yes, um, it is really interesting discussion with that host. That's <laughs> Then, uh, yes, uh, the, the public of the internet uh, concept is a quite uh, interesting topic, uh, in interesting, and then uh, I have uh, been wondering how it, 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 it could be uh, enforced uh, by, the, by the, the stakeholders of the internet. And then uh, I, I, I wonder how. So uh, the, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the nation, nation states, then uh, they, they, can, they can be, uh, they can, uh, that, that can be, legislated as the international law or treaty, then uh, that would be the that would be uh, the some some you know put some restriction for the for the each uh, nation states uh, which is entered to that treaty. Then uh, how how about the private sector, the ISPs, some other uh, security uh, major uh, private sector uh, firms? Then uh, that that would be the very big question. So uh, I, I'm really curious about that. Then uh, uh, the second second point is that the war time, how how we can how we can put, put some rule for the war time. Actually, that the internet that internet haven't uh, experienced the uh, war before. I, I think I think the Ukraine conflict is the one uh, the, the very first uh, war which the internet uh, confronts. So that's my uh, that's my that's my point. Uh, that, that's my uh, how I perceive. Then I'm quite curious about that. that and then uh, I'm I'm curious about uh, the proceedings of this discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Akinori. Adam. Hello, uh, yeah, Adam Peak. I work for ICANN, but we don't actually have a particular opinion on public core. So this is just me. Um, I uh, I agree about the infrastructure and cables and things. War and conflict, it's always been the first thing that happens. You blockade people and you cut the communication and nuclear weapons are now designed as much to take out communication infrastructure as they are to kill people. I mean, we have a whole weapon system that is designed to do that. Um, but the logical layer is new and different, newer and different. -er. Um, example would be the first Ira uh, Iraq war with an early early 2000s or was it 90s, um, first the, you would have remembered those pictures on Baghdad being bombed and all of that and they took out submarine cables and um, they took out communications towers, uh, they did not touch the CCTLD, um, it just remained in the route and remained operating. I don't know how you would do that, I don't think you can, I don't know how you enforce the public core but I think it's a very good principle. Um, I also think it's probably being violated. I think you can see um, attack <coughs> attacks, particularly on country code infrastructure, which tend to correlate to recent votes in the United Nations, but I don't actually have statistics on that. Um, but that would be interesting for some security agency to take a look at, security, you know, the biggest investigative thing. So it's a very important principle, but I think the time for the physical infrastructure is gone just because that's the what we as, as mentioned with the previous wars that's long gone and you can't undo that i think well there's always starlink and elon musk or well, you're going to shoot his satellites down um we have online um vacheslav who wants to speak vacheslav can you unmute yourself or can the techies unmute you uh He's yes unmuted. can you hear me? and then alexander can you hear me? We can hear you. Just introduce okay. yourself, please. Uh, Vyacheslav Yerohin. I'm a policy advisor working uh, for a Russian Ministry of Digital Development and Mass Media uh, and related uh, in areas related to internet, internet regulation, uh, and so for working in ICANN and ITU, many colleagues know me. I just want to uh, uh, echo or answer the question, in my opinion, question of Jorge Cancel, uh, uh, which uh, was raised in, in online chat. The question is how the public core can be protected effic efficiently. Uh, 
uh, in hard law in, in, in interventions, Chris mentioned sanctions. Uh, and I want to remember uh, Russian initiative um, convention uh, on international information security, which was uh, discussed in UN na uh, nation and even uh, approved as a concept. And in this uh, convention, uh, we propose uh, even number of norms related to, uh, to uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, one, uh, one more remark, I want to uh, echo one of the speakers who say that uh, taking account that critical infrastructure uh, practically in all, in many or practically in all cases is a private, uh, property. And uh, back to convention, in convention there are a couple of norms, I recommend it by the way to uh, read it, in convention uh, there are a couple of norms related to critical infrastructure, for example, uh, that states will not support critical infrastructure or operate uh, critical uh, infrastructure, but state will create conditions uh, for normal work or interoperable work of critical infrastructure. Uh, uh, number of norms that uh, states will uh, prevent uh, from uh, attack on critical infrastructure. Uh, it doesn't matter, it will be uh, hackers, criminal attacks, or it will be states attack. Uh, and such uh, a document at such convention from our point of view is answer how to uh, uh, protect critical infrastructure and public core. Global connectivity uh, can be stable, uh, politically uh, na natural, uh, and all actors should support uh, stable work of, this, uh, uh, of our public core. Unfortunately, not all actors, not all governments ready to take, manda I want to uh, stress, mandatory obligations uh, uh, to, uh, to support public core. Uh, convention uh, still uh, on the discussion. I recommend one more recommendation uh, to read early version of this convention because in early version it was more, uh, how to say, hard requ uh, requirements to uh, governments and to states. And later version of uh, this convention, after a uh, number of rounds, discussion rounds, it's more softer uh, requirements. Uh, Dr. These... can you, we've got three minutes left, so if you can just okay. conclude, okay. please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's our answer uh, how we can protect public core. Thank you. Uh, read, the read the document. Thanks. Thanks for those references, and please put them in the chat. It's it's helpful for for us to have those links. Chris, you wanted to respond, and then I'll go to Alexander. Alexander. Yeah. Uh, uh, very shortly, uh, Saint Vyacheslav. Uh, also, uh, I would like to mention one document uh, which was actually created about sanctions. That's multi-stakeholder approach to sanctions by PCH. But actually, it was saying something like uh, uh, that sanctions on infrastructure might be applied only in case of attack of infrastructure. It's very interesting. It's multi-stakeholder document, document. I just want to mention it. And actually, uh, I, I would remember, I think, a 2015 discussion uh, at tribe meeting in uh, Bucharest when s four Dutch lawyers uh, were discussing, like, um, uh, war, uh, um, uh, uh, norms of the war of, of uh, cyberspace, sorry, I forgot the right name of uh, th this document by United Nations, but they were trying to apply it. And I think that uh, we, we should try to restore this discussion because actually something happened, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm not actually <laughs> going to respond quite specifically. I think part of what I want to respond was it kind of coming from your Starlink <laughs> comment, Henriette. Um, I guess I'm arguing for a smaller definition of what's the, what the public core is. Um, and part of why maybe I can argue for that uh, is sort of 
in a sense, what we're trying to do with the internet, what we should be trying to do, and what I know the engineers are always trying to do, is reduce what is critical infrastructure. It's to make sure that there is as much redundancy and robustness and that the internet can, continu can continue to work. But that won't happen if you lose the sort of consensus around those public core logical layers that, like the root zone file and the, the re number registries. So it, it's not to sort of discount there will always be sort of bottlenecks, but that's what we're trying to sort of move beyond if possible. It's a, it's a less is more argument. Um, because it's true, we do have mobile broadband infrastructure that could be put into place quite easily, and that's movable. We have satellite linkages, but without the routing um, and, and uh, you know, the routing and addressing and naming infrastructure, that won't help us very much. Um, we have to come to an end. It's the end of the session. I've, I'm just checking if anyone online has any last minutes. Uh, comments. I don't really see anything there. I see Victor is, um, from the Polish government, a person who organized the IGF last year has joined us. Victor, it's very nice to, to have you. We are missing you in Addis. Um, I think that's it. Um, I think if there's any final, um, Paul, you can make a quick comment. Anyone else in the room? I, I just want to say, you know, I, I completely subscribe to the idea of the less we, we take as being absolutely critical, the easier it is for us to protect it. For one thing, you could have a Starlink, uh, you know, you can have a link up at uh, Dutch and in Holland and, you know, send it over to Canada or Japan. They, they've got infrastructure and you can protect the root file like that. It is built into the design to be robust. Yeah. But I don't think that that detracts from the argument that when infrastructure is used for the public internet, governments should afford forms of protection. And even if we go into the wartime scenario, if that principle is accepted, it would mean after the war, that's where damage repara you know, it, it has implications for, for reparations and, and the like. Yeah. So. Um, thanks very much, everyone. And I think thanks to our Dutch colleagues for not for being here, but making, for, for making it possible for all of us to be here and to have a good conversation. And thanks to everyone. I have to point out, I find it very inspiring that there are so many governmental participants in this uh, conversation. And I think that's good online as well, because I think governments do need to, to have this conversation, but not on their own.